what miracle were they looking for? They saw dangerous dimensions of God. But at the slightest opportunity, they bowed to bow. They committed adultery with Ashtaroth. For the duration of this, our teaching series, the, there are three critical verses we are going to be looking at to understand what it is that God is trying to communicate to us. As much as you can, try to ignore the sound that is coming from above. So we shouldn't have sound inside the hall distracting us. So children should be taken care of properly so that it doesn't add to the noise coming from above so that we can focus. So as much as you can, just keep your heart on the teaching and we trust Jesus to help us. So like I was saying, within the period we are going to go through this teaching, our pivot, the center of the expression of God's heart to us will be within the three verses of First Timothy chapter 1, 18, 19, and 20. So everything we are going to talk about is going to come from this place. And we began the teaching last week by exposing to us one, that you are going to be involved in what the Bible called a good warfare. A good warfare. And that warfare, according to scriptures, is the warfare of faith. Meaning that the end realization or the consequence of the warfare is either you keep the faith or you lose the faith. So first, you are going to be involved in a warfare. Two, that warfare is spiritual. The end game of the warfare is either you keep the faith or you lose the faith. And Paul was saying to Timothy as his spiritual father, he was speaking to Timothy as a spiritual son. He was saying to Timothy that one of the critical tools that, are, that you are going to use to execute your warfare or to be successful in your warfare is going to be prophecy. The prophecy that had been spoken over you. So what we want to add tonight in speaking about the battle for your faith is I want to, as Jesus helps me, show you three critical areas where this battle occurs. That if you do not win in those three areas, it's most likely that the um, end result that Paul described as a shipwreck of your faith will be your own testimony. And we are trying to make sure that you don't shipwreck your faith. That by the aid of prophecy that has been spoken over your life, you too can fulfill your destiny. So what we'll do first is just remind ourselves certain scriptures, then I'll dive into the teaching. So 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 18. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 18. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy. I'm reading New King James. I don't know what has happened to our visuals, but bring out your Bibles. Let's dive. It's going to slow me down, but let's see how we go. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. So first of all, he characterizes the warfare as good. And why does he call the warfare good? Because the Bible tells us that the trial of our faith is more precious than the trial of gold. Have you read that in scripture before? Why is it more precious than the trial of gold? Because it will bring upon you a greater weight of what? Glory. So it is important for you to realize that there is no Christian whose faith will not be tested. In fact, if your faith is not being tested, it's one of two things. It's either Satan does not consider you worthy of a test. So Satan has looked at you and found out that your profession is a lie. That you are not really one of those who have the faith. So he's not bothering 
to come around your space. You see, I've taught you before. Satan only goes after people he considers useful or he considers a threat. Satan never pursues useless people. So if you notice that your life is consistently under the pressure of attacks from the kingdom of the devil, is a sign that Satan sees your potentials. And he knows that if he leaves you to exercise your spirit, to grow in the things of God, you will deal a death blow to his agenda. So he's doing everything to try to stop you. So if your faith is not being tried, if you are not facing pressure from the kingdom of darkness, or God is not even putting you through situations that will prove your faith, it's possible that you don't have the faith. If it is the faith that you have, the faith of our ancestors, the faith that the apostles had, rest assured that your faith will be tried. Are you with me? So if you are not experiencing such trials, if you are not being put under such pressures, is a sign that probably in the realm of the spirit you have not been identified as one of us. Are you with me? The second thing that might occur if you notice that your faith is not being tested is that the season for a test has not yet arrived. Because whether you like it or not, you will go through it. Your faith will be tested. And what I want to do today is show you the three critical arenas where that test will occur. That if you are able to survive, you will not shipwreck your faith. It's when Pastor Mina was teaching last week, and I was showing my wife that he was in my notes. It's 50, 60% of the things that I, if I was the one teaching that Sunday, I would have taught. And the Lord just told me that, okay, you need to build this next Sunday. That's why we are doing Keep the Faith Part 2. Are you with me? There are many things to teach. I can begin to jump into many things, but in this place, we try to follow the leading of the Spirit. So it's possible that the season for the test had not come, and God is preparing you for that season. Whichever one holds true for your life, it's critical that you identify where you really belong. Paul says to Timothy, he says that you may wage the good warfare. How did we arrive at the conclusion that the good warfare is the warfare of your faith? 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12. We're just going through scriptures, then I'll begin to dive. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12. Have you found it? I'm going to be really slow with this. If I had known that this thing would not be available, maybe I would have prepared differently. So what does Paul say to Timothy here? He says, fight what? The good fight of faith. Lay on, hold on to what? Eternal life. To which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, he calls it the good warfare. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, he unveils what the fight is. What is the fight? It's the fight of what? Faith. It's the fight of faith. So, what I need to tell you quickly is that Satan, 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 he's not after your health, really. Satan, he's not after your money, really. Satan, he's not after your peace, really. What he's after is your faith. If by touching your health, he can affect your faith, then he will go for your health. If by touching your money, he can affect your faith, he will go for your money. If by touching your peace, he can go for your faith, he will go for your peace. So the thing that is the prize in the realm of the spirit for Satan, for the believer, is his faith. Is his faith. And whatever he needs to do, to make you not keep the faith, Satan is willing to pay the ultimate price to do it. He will fight you on any front necessary. If he has some form of inkling, some form of knowledge, that if he can attack you in this area, your faith will be compromised. Satan will come after you in that area until 
he gets you to bend the knee. And you need to realize that the devil is very, very patient. The devil can circle around a man's life for 10 years just waiting for an opportunity to get that man to compromise on his faith. So in, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7, Paul is the one now telling us, he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept what? The faith. Now there is prepared for me a crown of righteousness. So I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. So indicative of the fact that your Christian life is going to be a fight. Your Christian life is going to be a race. And the whole essence of the fight and the race is to see whether you will do what? Keep the faith. Are you with me? Look at it. Go back to verse 7. Go back to verse 7. Thank God is back. It will help me. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have done what? Kept my so you see, your Christian life is a fight. Your Christian life is a race. And the whole end game of it is that you will do what? Keep the faith. When we say your Christian life is a fight, what does it mean? It means that you have an enemy. And you see, in that fight, Satan does not play nice. Are you with me? You know, in, in, even as intense as boxing is they have rules hmm? what is that one that Israel Adesanya does what is that one UFC, UFC. Uh -huh. fight uh, even in that team that you see people's nose bringing blood and they can they can how do they say it in worry they can color be somebody's neck <laughs> huh? that they can give somebody a choke hold on the neck to try and suffocate the person even with such an intense fight. There are rules. But when Satan wants to fight you, he does not play nice. He does not fight according to the rules. Satan will look for an occasion to cripple you in destiny if you as much as allow him. So your Christian life is a fight. You have an enemy you are dealing with. Your Christian life is a race, meaning that in a race, there is an, a beginning point and there is a finish line. Are you still with me? Yes, stay with me. Stay with me. Don't be distracted. In a race, there is a beginning point and there is a what? So this is why he says, I have finished. Notice the words Paul is using. First, I have fought. So you will fight. The next thing he says is, I have what? Finished. Meaning that it's not enough to be in the race. What the Lord will be rewarding is finishers. Hmm? Not the ones that started, though, the ones that finished. This is why we don't have the time. When you study scriptures carefully, you will find out that there are certain phrases that run through the entire New Testament. Certain phrases. One is the phrase, he that endures to the end. Is in the entire New Testament. Indicative of the fact that in the matters of the Christian life, hmm, you will need endurance. Number two, it is the end that matters. So, dear brother, it's not everybody that started the race that can testify like Paul that I finished. Paul said, I finished the race. Meaning that I did not just begin running, I made it to the finish line so in a fight you have enemies in a race you have competitors and in the race your competitors are not your fellow believers are you with me in a race your competitors are not your fellow believers Peter put it this way he says that there are lusts of this world that war against your soul. He said they war against your soul. They are competing with the state 
of reality that God wants your soul to sustain. That if you do not take the posture of a sojourner and a pilgrim, you will lose to these things that war against your soul. So there are many things that are competing with you to guarantee that you do not finish. And one of the critical things that are competing with you is self. What did I call it? Self. self. And the word self simply means your fallen nature. The fallen nature of man. Many of you that have been around our circles, you have heard terms like advance on the path of spiritual progress. What does that thing mean? You say, I'm advancing on the path of spiritual progress. How do you measure spiritual progress? How do you even know you are on the right path of spiritual progress? Ben, come. Joe, come. Stand, stand, stand with me in a line. Stand, stand with me in a line. Now, this is how everybody is born into the world, into the visible realm. Have you read in scriptures that you are in the world, but you are not of the world? So you are in the world. So when you are born into the visible realm, you are in the world. What is the world? The cosmos, the system and the structures that Satan has put in place to guarantee that you do not finish. The systems and the structures that Satan has put in place to guarantee that his realities find free flow in the visible realm. So his reality of immorality, his reality of unfaithfulness, his reality of crime, his reality of witchcraft, his reality of oppression, the world mirrors those structures that make it easy for Satan to be the prince of this world, to be the god of this world. The cosmos is what gives him that privilege. So when you get born into the visible realm, this is your initiating point. You begin in the world and you begin wrapped with your fallen nature. Are you with me? So when you get born again, what happens is your fallen nature loses its control over your soul. That is why in theology we call it regeneration. We have something we call regeneration. What is regeneration? Your spirit comes alive and your soul that was con controlled by your fallen nature now comes under the government of your regenerated spirit. Are you with me? So your spirit man now controls your soul. That's your initiating point. But now that that has happened, you now need to advance in your work with God. And that is what we now call the path of spiritual progress. You are moving away from the control of the world and your flesh, and you are moving into God. Are you still with me? So, the way we measure whether a Christian is advancing or not is how far into God you have traveled. That's what is called the path of spiritual progress. You are progressing into God. And the yardstick for measuring, the measuring line, you know tailors, they have tapes that have inches and centimeters. The tape in the realm of the spirit is a person. So the way we measure whether you are advancing into God is that we check how much of Christ are you looking like. Are you with me? So the measuring tape is Christ. This is why we are not all holy at the same level. Because holiness is measured by the distance between the pilgrim and the world and the flesh. So there are some people that since they got born again, they've only taken one step distance. This is the level of consecration they have. And you see, brethren, consecration is very powerful because consecration is what allows the Holy Spirit to walk in your life without restriction. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Consecration is what allows the Holy Spirit to walk in your life without what? Restriction. So... When you get born again and there's life in your spirit, you now begin to 
hate the world. You now begin to hate the desires of your fallen nature and you are advancing into God. So he says, come out from amongst them and be you what? Separate. So there are people who, since they got born again, they've not moved beyond this. They are still here. Even though they have the life of God in their spirit, they've not separated themselves. They've not given the Holy Spirit room to walk within their lives. So they still struggle with the appetites of the fallen nature. The way we say it in our clan is they have not advanced on the path of what? Spiritual progress. And you see, that advancement, there's a work that the Holy Spirit does to make your advancement possible. A theological name for it is called sanctification. Are you with me? Yes. In sanctification, the Holy Spirit is now separating you from the love of the world and the things that are in the world. He's separating you from the weakness of your fallen nature. So if you don't consecrate yourself to the Holy Spirit, you are not giving him license to operate within your vessel. Are you with me? Yes, sir. And as long as the Holy Spirit does not have that license, you will not grow in God. It is better for you that I go, because if I do not go, he will not come. And when he comes, he will guide you into all truth. The word that is translated truth there is the word reality. And what is that reality? Is the reality of the person of the immortal spirit, God himself. The Holy Spirit drives you into the belly of God. He begins to affect your appetites. That is why it is abnormal. In fact, it's a sign of spiritual unwellness. For somebody to say, I am born again, and they don't have desire for the word of God. You are spiritually sick. Because if the Holy Spirit is actually within you, working his appetites in you, you should desire scriptures. When you see a Christian that can go days, months, weeks, years, without a yearning for personal Bible study and Bible reading, is a sign that the Holy Spirit is restricted in their vessel. They've not consecrated themselves to God to allow the Holy Spirit to operate without restrictions. So even though they claim to be born again, they've not advanced on the path of spiritual progress. This kind of people is very easy for them to shipwreck their faith. Very easy. Because when you are here, there are many things that are in the world and in your fallen nature that will keep pulling you out of an intimate union with Jesus. If you are still here, say amen. amen. So the driving force for the Christian is that he must advance on the path of spiritual progress. The farther you are into God, the farther you are from the world and from your flesh. So I need to ask you tonight, is it, is it possible for you to put your life on a screen tonight and ask yourself, how far have you traveled from the world? How far have you traveled from your fallen nature? This is why holiness is not the same for everybody. As we are seated in church now, you might be more holy than the person that is by your side. We are not all holy on the same level. The way holiness is measured is that we will check how far have you traveled from the corruption that is in the world. Sit down, man of God. Sit down. So it is possible to be on the path of spiritual progress and you are trying to advance into God, but something keeps dragging you back. And this is why even though many begin many don't what finish so if you read through the new testament you will see things like he that endures to the end when you enter into revelation you now begin to hear that he that what overcomes so even though people are rushing to get to heaven heaven is a place 
or the new Jerusalem is where overcomers will be recognized. The rewards that the Father has is for those who have what? Overcome. So Paul says, I have finished my race. Let me show you a scripture. Give me Colossians chapter 1. Give me verse 20. Colossians chapter 1 verse 20. Stay with me, stay with me, stay with me. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20. Are we still here? Is it still working? Give me 21. And you who were once, who once were alienated and eliminated in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled, 22, in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach where? In his side. 23. If indeed you do what? Where? In the faith. Go back to 22. Or go back to 21. Let's read it. Read it slowly so that you understand it. 21. And you who, were, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has done what? Reconcile. How did he reconcile you? In the body of his flesh, through what? So that he can do what? Present you how? How? Blameless. And above what? Reproach. Where? Because reproach is not powerful if it is men that reproach you. Hmm? Men reproach you, that reproach that men have for you have no weight on your destiny. Men can despise you, it doesn't matter. But if you are reproached in God's sight, eh, no man can validate you. The validation of men becomes useless if the reproach is in the sight of God. It's like when Saul stood with Samuel and said, honor me in the eyes of the people. And Samuel said, okay, no problem. And they stood together and they said, hey, and the people shouted, king of Israel, king of Israel. The person they were celebrating had already been reproached in the sight of God. The whole celebration was useless. He had been uprooted from destiny, yet men were celebrating him. So he says, so that you will be holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue where? Grounded and what? And are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, 